Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, so we're going to get into acute stroke priorities and treatment and kind of what we're going to do. This is an overview slide. And then um, like I brought up in my other video, I moved some stuff around. So I moved like my ICP stuff into after this slide. So I'm going to skip through all those slides. I have a different video that I talk about those. So you're welcome to watch that if you think that would be helpful to you. Um, but just if it's a little disorganized, like I was thinking of trying to move it, move it back, but it is fine the way it is. Um, I just sometimes after I start like lecturing on in these videos, like I'm like, oh, well, it, it fits better in a different place. So um, just don't mind me if I'm scrolling through, I'm going to just be like, just, you know, watch my other video if you want, if you want to learn about this. So but anyway, so someone's having an acute stroke. Um, there's kind of like two phases of stroke. There's like the acute period, they're coming into the hospital, they're having a stroke right now, we need to restore blood flow, um, you know, protect their brain. Um, and then there's the like, more like long-term, like chronic management of their deficits and other things. So first let's, we're gonna talk about acute stroke parties. What can I do? So the big thing that I'm gonna be focused on is flow to the brain, what, either because they have a clot, um, plaque buildup, um, that like a, they've thrown a clot because they have um, AFib and they threw a clot to their brain or they're bleeding in their brain, there's a um, like cell death occurring and there is less flow to the brain. So um, my main priority or intervention early on is, is going to be maintaining or restoring perfusion to that. Um, there's only so much I can do as the nurse, but one of the biggest things I can do is to manage their ICP. Um, so that's why I have the IC, I moved the ICP lecture to after this section. Definitely highly recommend watching that um, and um, uh, learning a, a little bit about that. It will definitely help to understand what you're gonna be doing as the nurse. Um, the other things we want to do rapid assessment. So this is something like that we call a code stroke. We have, uh, you know, a team of individuals that comes and we get things done like stat, like it's like every, um, it's, it's like the opposite of everything that you do in a nursing school question where you're like, Hey, you know, like you're imagining you're doing one thing at a time every, like it would be like having a drag and drop that had 14 options. And like, you literally have 14 people and one person's doing each. If you don't understand my analogy, just ignore me. It's not important. I'm just rambling. Like I tend to do. Um, but anyway, so like a lot of people are working on this patient, getting all this stuff done. Um, we're effectively trying to restore blood flow because time is brain, just like with a heart attack, time is muscle, time is brain. Um, so the main treatments that we do for ischemic stroke, and I'm going to break these down and give you more details about these, is we give what's called TPA um, for an ischemic stroke. Um, we can also do what's called a stent retriever, which is where we actually like kind of suck out the blood clot that is blocking it. Um, and so you think with an ischemic stroke, they've had a clot. So we're going to do things to remove or get rid of that clot and a hemorrhagic stroke. We can't do a lot with, but pretty much we don't want to make it worse. So we're going to do things like avoiding things that are going to make them bleed more, um, making sure their blood pressure is not too high, um, stopping them from spasming, especially if they had that subarachnoid um, type of bleed. And then, um, there is some procedures if they have an aneurysm to fix that. So like I said, I'm going to skip through the ICP stuff because it's on a separate lecture. All right, so this is in class. We're gonna do some TPA trivia, so much fun, don't worry. You'll, ha you'll love it. So let's talk about what we're gonna do first when a patient comes into the hospital. Um, so the priority question, this is always going to be the first question that we want to um, ask is, is, is when did your stem, stem, symptoms, uh, when did your symptoms start or what's your last known normal? Um, this is so important because there's a very um, tight window of time that we can give um, certain medications or do certain treatments, especially for an ischemic stroke. Um, so we need to know, do they fit into that window? Cause that's really going to guide our treatment and guide. Like if we're like, go, 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 we're going to try to give them this treatment. Um, we really need to know. Now, sometimes people know if someone was with them, but you'll see it happen a lot where people are like, Hey, you know, yeah, they woke up this way. If they woke up that way, um, they most likely are not going to be a candidate for TPA. They, they won't be a candidate for TPA because we don't know when they stopped being okay. Um, or sometimes it will happen where um, someone will be with someone and like they won't really be able to pinpoint exactly when um, things happen. If they don't know when, I mean, they can only give us so much information, um, but we just have to make a decision based off of that about what's next. So we need to know when did the symptoms start? Because again, we have a window of time that we can use or do certain treatments. And we always start with the ABC. Some of these patients may be very, um, they may be, I was gonna say very unconscious, <laughs> like very low level of consciousness. 
Um, and so we want to start with the airway, make sure it's patent, making sure we're supporting um, their airway. They may need to be intubated if it's severe. Um, we're going to give them oxygen and, uh, you know, per their prescription, we want to hyper oxygenate them to an extent. What I mean by that is we want to make sure that we keep their oxygen above 95% um, and just uh, make sure to support them because this is a, um, like a kind of like with a heart attack where they need um, their cell death. There's more of a demand for oxygen and always, not always a supply. So we want to give them that extra oxygen. Um, we're going to provide interventions to maintain ICP. And I talked about that in my ICP lecture. If you're not sure, you're welcome to go back and watch that. Um, the nurse needs to perform the baseline NIH. I did a video over the NIH assessment. You can watch that, like I mentioned. And one of the first things we want to do after we get them ABC stabilized is um, <clears throat> uh, start with um, um, getting a really good um, head-to-toe neuro assessment. So remember how I said like, um, there's a team and there like might be 14 things we're doing. Like imagine all these things are going to be happening, but like a different person's doing all of them. But in nursing school, remember, it's just you and you have to figure out, okay, it's just me. Which of these am I going to do first? But in real life, like there's 15 people helping with all these things. Um, anyway, sorry. I, I just, I know I, I shouldn't bring up real life, but it's hard not to, because sometimes the delusion of nursing school is just so crazy. Um, anyway, um, so uh, what do you call it? Um, we want to get a very good baseline neurological assessment, see where we're starting, what deficits are present. Because if we're going to give them treatment, we, we need to see if they're better. And if we don't know what their baseline is, we don't know if they're getting better. Um, baseline vital signs are really key too, um, especially the blood pressure. Um, there are certain parameters around the blood pressure that tell us whether we can or cannot give medication. So we definitely need to um, uh, know what their blood pressure is and we need to manage it. People with um, strokes come in with a very high blood pressure. Usually like I'm talking about two hundreds over one hundreds. Um, so that's not that uncommon. Cause you have to think about it. The brain is in crisis. It's like, Hey, I'm not getting flow. So sometimes it's going to, um, you know, like overreact or over, um, compensate, um, to try to get that extra flow to the brain. Um, sometimes also hypertension causes the stroke. So it can be like either side of things. Sometimes it's the cause of the stroke or sometimes it's a result of the stroke. Um, and then we're going to start, you know, managing their hypertension if it's present. We want enough flow to the brain. So these patients, we don't like their blood pressure low. Um, you know, we, we just don't want it too high either. Cause especially if it's a bleeding stroke and if their blood pressure is high, that's just going to like encourage more blood loss. Um, but with a ischemic stroke, we don't want their blood pressure too high. Cause that's more constriction. We want enough flow though. Cause they need, we need to kind of compensate. That there's this lack of flow. Um, so we actually usually like most patients with a stroke, like we, generally maintain them like 140s to 160s for their systolic blood pressure. It varies. That's not something you would be tested over. There is other numbers with blood pressure you'll be tested over, but they'll be on other slides. Um, we need to get that CT of the head done so that we can see if they qualify for TPA or if, um, you know, they um, pretty much ruling out again, whether they're having ischemic or hemorrhagic. So just to remind you, if you didn't watch my ramblings in the diagnostic video, um, the CT of the head, effectively what that tells us, we can't see that they're having an ischemic stroke, but we need to rule out that they're not having a hemorrhagic because that can help to guide us. There's some patients that come in like we can't necessarily right then and there know for sure they're having a stroke. Everything's kind of pointing towards it. There was this um, guy that I took care of one night and he was like a Walmart or some employee. And I mean, he was, he walked into my, um, like, it was really strange. He walked into my ICU room and he was sitting there. He's like in there. They were like, yeah, he had a stroke. And I was like looking at him and I'm like, you guys sure. Like, you know, so but pretty much what happened is he was showing all the signs of a stroke. Um, they did a CT scan and there was no bleed. And so based on his symptoms, um, they went ahead and gave him TPA. And I mean, he was like, what I said, by the time he got to me, like he was walking in, like he had no deficits, he was fine. Um, um, but um, I don't think he had a lot of deficits to begin with, but he was having some signs of stroke. Well, sometimes they err on the side of caution, just depending on the person's risk and stuff like that. But we have to do that CT of the head to make sure they're not bleeding. So like with this guy, maybe we gave him TPA. He never had a stroke, um, but we don't mess around with time is brain. I'm not saying a lot of people just randomly get TPA, but um, what I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is that um, in that acute period, we don't have a lot of time to give that med. And so sometimes we err on the side of caution if the doctor doctor is pretty sure that it's a stroke based on everything he can see, um, then they'll usually go and um, give TPA as long as they're not bleeding. So that's why we have to get that CT to the head to make sure they're not bleeding. 
Um, we talked about these labs, the blood glucose, to make sure that it's not hypoglycemia and that it is more likely like ruling out other possible causes of their mental status um, or cognition changes. Um, coagulation to see um, if they're bleeding or able to clot effectively. Um, and then electrolytes to see um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, to see pretty much the elect the point of the electrolytes is is to make sure that there's no crazy imbalances or something else that could be causing issues. I'm um, just to make sure they're stabilized. And then we're going to assess for contraindications um, for the TPA, which we're going to talk about all about TPA soon. Um, and um, effectively, if you haven't already gotten the hint with TPAs, there's a there's reasons to give it, and there's also a lot of reasons not to give it. So that's what we're going to talk about. And then we will also get two large bore IVs. And there's a couple reasons for this. If we're going to give a patient TPA, they're going to be super high risk for bleeding. So um, I need to, before I give something that's going to make someone bleed a whole lot and not be able to stop bleeding, I want to poke them for the last time for 24 hours. Um, you know, once I insert those IVs, I'm like, you know, we really don't like to stick a patient who's receiving TPA or has received TPA for 24 hours. So I want to get two large IVs that are going to work really well um, so that I don't have to stick this patient um, anymore while they're getting the, I can't stick them anyway, but um, you know, I really want to um, get some good working IVs so that I can still give meds and stuff. And then we're also always concerned that they, we want them to be adequately hydrated just because their blood pressure is high does not mean that they're well hydrated. Um, so usually we'll get some um, running IV fluids, gentle IV fluids going. Okay, I'm going to make a separate video for TPA. I think I'm, I'm feeling in the mood. So I'll see you for the next one.